And this time I'll make the case for middle powers like Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and South Africa to learn something from India, from the Indian experience over the last 25 years or so. And for some very obvious reasons. Uh, first of all, because India is, is outperforming in every field economically, diplomatically, I'd say even militarily. If you take as a proxy indicator the topics being chosen by IER students, both at undergrad and graduate levels, in US academe, you will definitely come across references to India as the power to be. I believe that's a good proxy indicator for the world to come, because if you look back some 10 or 15 years ago, China was uh, occupying this place. Uh, one second reason for us to pay attention to New Delhi, to pay attention to India, is uh, the way India has transformed what some people and some countries see as a liability into an asset. I'm referring to democracy. The way, a very adroit, very deft way, India has been maneuvering in this global governance, in this uh, globalization three or four, uh, I think it's remarkable. The way India, while catering to its people's needs, uh, it projects not in unison, but it projects the weight of its huge, enormous constituency. And uh, in this regard, I mean, Brazil is a big democracy from the global south as well. Indonesia, Mexico, and the like, they should find ways to explore this feature and to profit from this characteristic because, again, it's an asset. And uh, referring to the title of this session, Shaping a New Ethos of Geopolitics and Geoeconomics, I think democracy should be included in whichever format we follow in the future. So our countries have a role to play. I'm very much convinced about it. And uh, third, and maybe most importantly, uh, I believe India has been able to escape what the literature calls the tragedy of middle power politics. And what is it? Traditionally, middle powers tend to abide by the rules, tend to incorporate the norms, the institutions, and while doing so, they might even get some short-term rewards but they end up wearing a straight jacket. They lose autonomy. So if they run their foreign policies in accordance with the major powers playbook, they won't ever speak by themselves. But on the other hand, if you try to revise the world order, you might get punished, both symbolically and materially. I still remember when Brazil, along with Turkey and Iran, they have reached an agreement on Tehran's nuclear program after being openly encouraged by US President Barack Obama, then US President Obama. But by the time they announced, by the time the parties announced they were signing the agreement, then U.S. Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, uh, totally uh, unauthorized uh, at the level of the United Nations Security Council, this so-called uh, Tehran Decorate, Tehran Agreement was pulled down. And I think it reflects 
to a large extent, the way uh, great powers tend to block and make emerging nations' lives difficult. I mean, I think it gives a good uh, metaphor. Uh, it tells a lot about our efforts uh, to sit at the high table and uh, how they might be uh, recurrently blocked. So I believe India has been successful in a sense in both. Gently revising or gently bidding for some revision at the systemic level while negotiating its entrance into this condominium of powers. So I think to the extent that India proves able to cope with or to come to terms with some of its human rights issues, India is a good role model for this proposal of shaping a new ethos for geopolitics and geoeconomics.